This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello, welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Simpuga, and here is what's coming up. This trip is about uh, an independent relationship and partnership with African nations and African leaders based on a number of factors that have to do with the past, the present, and the future. That was U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris speaking to journalists after her visit to Ghana. Also, Vice President Harris heads to Tanzania, and Egypt looks ahead to elections. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. Vice President Kamal Harris met with the Roundtable of Women Entrepreneurs today to discuss economic empowerment and leadership as she wrapped up her visit to Ghana. Afterward, she spoke with some of the journalists traveling with her in Africa. She told them that President Joe Biden's administration is expanding its engagement in Africa. It's not in response to any other power. Uh, this trip um, is not about China. This trip is about uh, an independent relationship and partnership with African nations and African leaders based on a number of factors that have to do with the past, the present, and the future. The past, well, our histories are intertwined. Um, our, our, the present, well, you can look at, for example, the presence of the diaspora throughout the visit um, here in Ghana, whether it be during the, um, the state dinner hosted by the president of Ghana or even when we were at Cape Castle yesterday. The future, and I know you all have heard me say this many times, the median age of this continent is 19. By 2050, which is not a long time from now, one in four people on Earth will be on this continent. And so just on that alone, on the demographics of it all alone, if you put aside the present and the past, if we are to be forward-looking in terms of national policy and priorities, we have to look at this continent. Harris also spoke about the aid the U.S. government is pledging in public and private funding to empower women on the continent. One billion dollars um, that is a function of a collaboration between the public and the private sector. And the private sector, by the way, includes not only corporate but also philanthropy, right? So the Melinda and Bill Gates, for example, that I mentioned today, Ford Foundation, some others. And the potential here is about an investment in the potential of this continent and its young people. It is about focusing on issues like not only the digital economy, but its application to what we must do to, to, to address the climate crisis. Um, that's both about resilience and adaptation, but also carbon capture. That was actually part of the conversation that we had this morning. Um, there is the work that is about balancing and understanding that on this continent, when you look at the future, um, there is great opportunity, but as with everything else, there's a duality, there's also risk. That was U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris speaking to journalists as she was leaving Ghana. Reporter Kent Mensah spoke with women in Accra today about Harris's visit and her focus on empowering women economically and politically. Marcia Tago is a customer relations officer and says she thinks Harris may understand well the challenges women face in public life. I think because uh, Kamala is, um, is a woman, so she pretty much understands what a woman goes through. I don't know what she has faced, I don't know her difficulties, what she has been through, but I think in our context she really understands when a woman needs support, when a woman needs uplifting. So, I mean, she sees that in the African women. She sees African women who need the uplifting and the support. So I think it's, it's great that she's, she's helping and she's empowering uh, women in Africa here. Betty Oson says the challenges for women often mean they have to work harder than men do. Yason is a sports journalist, a field dominated by men. The men were assigned to some challenging task, so I had to take it upon myself 
to work on some challenging tasks that I have not been assigned to. Because it was more of, oh, Betty, go and do this production. Go and speak to this person. You're a woman. So I think it is about people have to understand that a woman is worth more the gender that, I mean, the gender. We are worth more being a woman. The fact that I'm a woman doesn't mean that it limits me to a certain task. Gift Adunya is a trader. She says U.S. promises of economic support for women in Ghana could benefit many families. Those who already have um, their businesses and, and are established, I think when they get some more financial support, they can expand their business and help other women to you know, be empowered financially. And so I think um, a support like this coming from a fellow woman, a fellow woman like um, Kamala Harris, it's a great inspiration. And it's something that would tell you the woman that put this money in good use. The U.S. Vice President arrived in Ghana on Monday. She arrives this evening in Tanzania. She's the fifth senior U.S. representative to visit the continent this year as part of President Joe Biden's effort to engage more widely with African nations. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris's visit to Tanzania this week comes as relations have greatly improved under President Samia Suluhu Hassan, while the late President John Magufuli pursued China-backed mega projects and cracked down on critics. Hassan has promised to let democracy flourish. Mokbu Yeboro has this report prepared by Charles Kumbe in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Onesmo Olengurumwa has long fought for democracy and human rights in Tanzania. He says it was a harder struggle under the rule of President John Magafuli, who died two years ago from a heart ailment. Olengurumwa works with the Tanzanian Human Rights Defenders Coalition. We faced a lot of challenges as an activist group. We received numerous letters from the authorities asking us to stop our work as human rights defenders. We were repeatedly questioned by the authorities, and our internal meetings were often disrupted without any specific reason. Magafuli focused on large Chinese-backed infrastructure projects like a standard gauge railway. Beijing also built the Mualimu Nyerere Leadership School, a communist party training school that critics say promotes the Chinese single-party ideology. After his death, then-Vice President Samia Suluhu Hassan rose to power and has since then taken steps to advance democracy and expand diplomatic ties. In video supplied by the Tanzanian State House, she says reforms will take time. Every journey of development begins with a step, and that progress will come gradually, according to the laws and guidelines set for Tanzania. I promise you, my fellow countrymen, that reforms are there, and we will build a new nation, a nation of Tanzania with competitive politics and without violence. The U.S. has taken note of President Hassan's actions to promote democracy and improve human rights. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris arrives there later today, and her visit is seen as part of the U.S. efforts to strengthen ties. Haji Semboja is a political analyst and a lecturer on the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Dar es Salaam. Currently, the president is showing signs of wanting to build a democratic country. That is why the United States sees us as allies and believes we can work together. In this partnership we are speaking about, first and foremost, the U.S. will assist us in strengthening democracy, justice, and freedom in our country. Therefore, our president will be willing to look at all institutions related to democratic issues. Despite challenges, Olangurumwa says he's hopeful Tanzania will continue to move further toward justice and democracy. Mokbil Yabaro with VOA News for Charles Kombe in Dar es Salaam. For a deeper look at Vice President Kamala Harris's visit to Tanzania, I spoke with Deodatus Balili, the chairperson of Tanzania Editors Forum. He's also the managing editor of Jamhuri Media Limited, publishers of a weekly investigative newspaper, Jamhuri. He told me that Tanzanians are excited about Harris's visit to the East African nation. In total, we are so much excited to have this high-level delegation visiting Tanzania. We understand that the ties between the U.S. and Tanzania through this kind of visit will be growing high and higher. Uh, the vice president, she has been in Ghana, and while there, 
she highlighted the role of women and women in emancipation. The, the Tanzanian president is a woman too. Do you think that's going to be beneficial to their discussions? Without even a second of hesitation, I can say 100% her visit is going to be an impetus, a motivation to most women here in Tanzania to make sure that they also go for high offices. Because it has been a norm in the most, in most African countries where presidential candidates or presidents uh, mainly have been men. And the President Samia Nur Hassan has been setting the pace, let's say, for East Africa. She has become the first woman president for any East African countries. And the, uh, along the line of history in Tanzania, she has been the first as well. So we think her visit, and the, the, it, it is going to bring about the courage, to bring about the composure for people to see that, okay, President Samia, she is not alone, and other women are holding high offices in other countries, especially in a big country like USA. So it is an encouragement and a motivation to most women and men as well to see that we are not unique because at a time, some people might be thinking that it's only Tanzania which has a woman president or a, a, a woman at such a high level. So I think this is an encouragement for the society in general. Uh, president Samia has been hailed recently for her ch- changes in the political landscape of Tanzania and giving room to opposition. Do you think that also may factor in as far as the region is concerned? Sure, of course, worldwide, it has been a concern that civic space was closing at a supersonic speed here in Tanzania in the past seven years. But with the coming of President Samia, she set up a task force to review the, the political situation in the country, and she ordered the Minister for Information, Napen Nawie, to, in collaboration with the media stakeholders, to review media laws, media laws, and even today, we had a meeting, uh, an annual ret- uh, retreat uh, for editors here in Tanzania, graced by Minister Nape, where now the government has submitted uh, a proposal to the parliament for media laws review. So we are seeing these signs, which I'm aware the pro- diplomatic call will be even notifying Her, Her Excellency Vice President of these kind of changes which are effected by President Samia, and not just being affected, uh, apart from looking at the legal ambit, she has gone a bit ahead by visiting the opposition party meeting on the 8th of March. So she's a kind of opening civic space, and this is what the world is looking for, and is something to applause. That's uh, Daudatas Balile, the chairperson of Tanzania Editors Forum. He's also the managing editor of Jamhuri Media Limited, publishers of a weekly investigative newspaper, Jamhuri. He spoke with me from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. You are listening to African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Impuga in Washington. For more information on these and other stories from the continent, please see voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. For the world news, check out voanews.com. A Danish-owned vessel that was boarded by pirates in the Gulf of Guinea has been spotted 540 miles off the coast of the Republic of Congo. On Tuesday... Five armed people boarded the Liberian flagged oil and chemical tanker about 140 miles west of Port Noir. Reuters says 16 crew members on the Monjasa reformer sought refuge in a safe room aboard the ship. The incident is being monitored by a cooperation center between the French and British navies called the Maritime Domain Awareness for Trade, Gulf of Guinea. The company that owns the boat says communication channels with the vessel are down and could not provide Reuters news with more details for security reasons. A second rise in prices, a record rise in prices and the collapse in the value of the Egyptian currency are leading to rising public unhappiness. That comes as the country prepares for elections next year at the end of President Abdel Fattah Sisi's second term. So far, Sisi has not said if he will run for a third term which would allow him to stay in power until 2030. Said Sadiq, professor of political sociology 
at the American University in Cairo discussed the different scenarios for the election with VOA senior analyst Mohamed Al Shanawi. It is normal when the national economy hits a hard rock that the popularity of the incumbent president plummets. Opposition rhetoric and enthusiasm would rise against the regime and people call for a change and they look for someone to blame for what is happening. And this means change of the head of the political system. But in authoritarian systems, change is not that simple nor easy. It is usually through revolution or coups, not through elections. Revolution has not been available since 2013 in Asia. Coups are difficult. The only option that seems clear and opposition wish for is a fair, transparent election and the existence of real presidential candidates who have viable alternative programs to save the economy. So far, no candidate has declared officially that he or she fits the bill. Sisi, while not officially declaring his standing for the election for a third time, his public activities indicate that he has not abandoned running a third term. He made statement that only God can prevent him from running as a president. His recent moves and activities show that he is in a re-election campaign without elucidating it. Remember when he went to the stadium to distribute food for almost 6 million families. If he decides not to run, it would also mean that the army is abdicating politics. And this is highly unlikely so far. Supporters of Sisi say he has achieved much in addition to the establishment of the new administrative capital, new cities, the development of the road and bridge network, the expansion of the Suez Canal, and the elimination of terrorism. But his opponents accuse him of suppressing freedom of expression, arresting thousands, being responsible for the collapse of the local currency, increasing poverty poverty rates, rising foreign debt, deteriorating economic situation, and the crisis of the Renaissance Dam with Ethiopia. Which side will tip the balance in Egypt? The internal and external forces supporting Sisi have receded compared to when he came to power in 2013-2014. But the counter forces are not yet strong enough to field an alternative realistic candidate. The opposition is still drowned in rhetoric and gets a lot of attention from the people for their critique of the regime economic policies, but provide no viable replacement with a program or a candidate who can deal with the economic crisis the external and domestic debt, the Ethiopian dam, corruption, overpopulation. Therefore, so far, the pro CC camp still holds sway controlling the deep state and branches of government. Moreover, external forces that back the regime do not want any unpredictable changes in the area, including Egypt, for the time being, because they are so busy with China, Russia, Ukraine, and so they don't want any disturbance in the Middle East. Leading the names of potential candidates to compete against the president are former parliamentarian Ahmed Tantawi, Gamal Mubarak, the son of the former Egyptian president Hosni Mubarak, and the son of the brother of the late Egyptian president Mohammed Anwar Sadat, amid fears of harassment inflicted on any candidate hinting at the possibility of running for the presidential race. Would these names stand any chance to win or just be used to give the process a legitimate image? To have fair, free, transparent elections, you need more than monitoring and supervising polling stations on the election day. Any candidate needs free interaction with the people, no harassment to followers and supporters, and above all, change of the existing political culture. Luckily, free internet uh, social media exists and more popular even than state-run media. Uh, so any candidate can run a campaign on YouTube and Facebook and be watched by millions of followers inside Egypt. It is, however, possible that the impact of the opposition rhetoric and dissatisfaction with the regime that the turnout in the upcoming presidential election might be far much lower than any previous period of Sisi's re-election rule. That was Saeed Sadiq, professor of political sociology at the American University in Cairo. He, sp- he spoke by phone with my colleague, Mohamed al Shanawi.
Experts on the crisis in Chad say there's more to the interim government's recent pardoning of almost 400 rebels than meets the eye. The fighters from the Front for Change and Cocod in Chad, or FACT, uh, were given life sentences last week on various charges, including terrorism and killing former President Idris Debe, the father of current Chad leader Muhammad Debe. Darren Taylor reports. Chad's military captured the rebels from the Front for Change and Concord in April 2021. Idris Debi, who ruled the country for three decades, was killed when he went to visit troops fighting on the front lines at the time. Chad analyst at the Africa Diaspora Forum in Johannesburg, Abdul Karim Elgoni, says on the surface, freeing the fact fighters is risky. Those rebels came from Libya, and in Libya they were supporting General Haftar, and they have received excellent training from the Russians in Libya, and they are very well equipped. Some other observers are asking why Mohammed Debi released hundreds of well-trained rebels. Chido Chase Nyere from the University of Johannesburg's Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation thinks the prisoner release is part of a strategy to ensure Derby's government remains in power. The pardoning is just a masquerade to try and force these so-called rebels to come to the negotiating table. I say so-called rebels because they are now really opposition political factions. The government itself, the so-called establishment in Chad, is illegitimate. After Idris Debi's death, a military council led by his son was established to govern the country for an 18-month transition period. Mohammed Debi was supposed to hand power to an elected government last October, but elections never happened and Debi remained as interim president. The military then extended the transition period by two years, with elections in October 2024. But El Ghani says Derby and his military supporters are not interested in building a just, equal society. A tribe is ruling Chad, and the rebels are from a different tribe from the north. And they wanted a share of the rule of the country. They want a share of the cake. The tribe that is ruling in Chad, headed by Debi, is not ruling in an inclusive way. And everyone is complaining about it, other different tribes. He thinks the African Union and international community aren't keen to oppose Mohammed Debi for a variety of reasons. To be frank with you, no one is happy about another war in Chad or in the region. Not the AU, not the ECOWAS, because Chad is main supporter against Al-Qaeda and its affiliate in West Africa, and not France, not Sudan, which has its western border already bad with tribal fights, so there is no one who has an appetite for a rebel movement to come and disturb the peace. El Ghani points out many powers also want access to Chad's resources, which include gold, diamonds and uranium. Nyere says Chad, like a growing number of African countries, is increasingly in the middle of a battle for influence between the West on one side and China and Russia on the other. He says it appears the Mohammed Debi government wants to use this to its advantage. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Simpuga in Washington. For all the latest developments,